Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Challenges of Parathyroid Hormone Testing in Patients with Chronic Kidney Disease. It is presented by Ravinder Singh, PhD, Director of the Endocrine Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want anytime you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Singh. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Judy for the great introduction. And thanks everyone for joining uh, this uh, online presentation. And topic I'm covering today is the current state of PTH testing in patients with chronic kidney disease. The objectives of the talk today will be, we will talk about a little bit of history about the PTH test development and what's the current state of the PTH assays, and what is the latest contribution of the mass spec method development for PTH, and uh, what are the various PTH fragments, and where is this development of the novel mass spec method by mass spec or other uh, modalities is going? This just slide uh, reminds that the location of the parathyroid gland is embedded. Uh, in the thyroid tissue itself. They're very teeny glands, and uh, the surgeons, when they do the parathyroidectomy, they are able to locate it by using radiology techniques and <clears throat> are able to cure the patient. These are the glands which create parathyroid hormone. How does parathyroid hormone interact with different uh, analyzing the physiology and let's talk about the role of PTH in the vitamin D endocrine system here, for example. And as we all know, vitamin D is one of the highest ordered uh, tests these days and a lot of curiosity about vitamin D. But there is a very close interaction between vitamin D and PTH. If the calcium level is low in the human circulation, that low calcium sends a signal to the parathyroid gland, which makes a PTH or parathyroid hormone, which immediately gets to the bone receptors uh, and uh, resolves the bone and corrects calcium in the circulation. The PTH also activates one alpha hydroxylase at the kidney to convert 25 to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, and 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is the bioactive form of 25. Once 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is available in physiology, it acts on the receptors and the gut or the intestine level and helps in absorbing the minerals, especially calcium and phosphorus, back into the human circulation and it helps in depositing back into the bones. The next slide here shows the complexity of the same vitamin D, PTH, um, endocrine system, and now in this case, I have the parathyroid hormone in the center of the diagram that how this is critical for the whole physiology of maintaining calcium and formation of vitamin uh, uh, D, which is the active form of vitamin D. What is the clinical utility of the PTH assays? Uh, it uh, helps in differential diagnosis of hypercalcemia. It helps in the diagnosis of hypo parathyroidism and as well hyperparathyroidism. And in the category of hyper, it will be both primary and psychohyperparathyroidism. 
and the third will be diagnosing renal osteodystrophy and improving patient management in um, chronic kidney disease patients. Since this is a very complex disease, uh, physicians have various algorithms, and this is just one of the algorithms published by the National Kidney Foundation <clears throat> in case of the secondary hyperparathyroidism, how to use PTH assay. As you can see here, in patients with a reduced GFR, there will be a reduced formation of 125, and then effect on the PTH patient, and those patients will fall in the category of the secondary hyperparathyroidism, and they will <clears throat> have the loss of the bone quality, and will uh, lead to the bone resorption. Here are the guidelines for the CKT bone villain density and uh, kind of defines what are the target levels for serum calcium phosphorus and PTH in a patient population who is affected by uh, renal disease or low kidney function or with a chronic kidney disease. The calcium should be between 8 and 8.5 and 10.2, which is the same as the reference range for the normal healthy people. Phosphate 3.5 to 5.5, and the calcium phosphate product should be less than 55. <clears throat> in the values of the intact PTH, normally in the healthy population, go up to 50 picogram per ml, but it is recommended that in patients with a stage 4 or stage 5 chronic kidney disease, the PTH values can be as high as 110 or 300 picogram per ml in stage 5 patients, and that may be the normal level for patients who have the chronic kidney disease. The purpose of this slide showing here is that calcium is critical for making the diagnosis of these patients, whether they have hypercalcemia or not. And in our laboratories, we are very proud of the quality of the calcium testing um, because the, all the calcium tests by all manufacturers and vendors are very well standardized. Interestingly, the normal values are also very well standardized. They go from 8.5 to 10.2 in all the hospitals in the lab. <clears throat> and clinically, the doctors will take a action if the value drops by more than 0 0.4 or 0 0.37 milligrams per DL. And the CLIA acceptable performance, which is the CAP, also acceptable performance will be within plus minus one milligram per DL to pass the quality of the test among various labs. I'm going to review some of the CAP or College of American Pathologists data for the PTH assays from their survey as recent as 2018. This slide shows that um, how many labs are performing a particular manufacturer assays. As you can see it here, out of 1,500 labs, there are 500 labs which are performing roche Kovas assay. And then the second one would be close to 400 labs which are performing Siemens APS, and the rest you can look at yourself. But we have many, many manufacturers in the field who make various assays the different labs have chosen to go with different manufacturers based upon their own experience and the qualities of the assays. How does the data look like when the CAP survey gets sent out uh, the labs and the labs return their values? So this is all the data uh, which they have received back for the 2018 survey. And the CAP shipped out three samples where the all method mean in the blue color is the with a value of 127.75. The red one is 390.53. And the green one is 33.76. So if all the methods were standardized very well, then we should have seen <clears throat> that all they would have reported the same values. But I will show you in the next slide how do these results vary from one to each other. This uh, slide is highlighting that the CV of the assay does increase for the green sample, which has a lower mean value compared to the blue uh, sample, which has a higher or the red value. So the CVs are in general lower for the higher parathyroid values, but they're slightly higher uh, for the low uh, all-method mean value. 
and some manufacturers have a CV in the range of 15% or higher, and the, some manufacturers are performing close to 5%. And as we know, as a laboratorian, the lower the CV, the better is the assay. But interestingly, the manufacturers who have low CV for the highest samples, like blue and green, but their CV is even higher uh, for the particularly that low value sample. And this particular slide is showing that how do the assays differ in their values. If the all methods were similar to each other, then we would have seen all blue, green, and uh, red bars at 100%. Everybody would have agreed with each other. What you're saying here is that different manufacturers have a different biases from the all method mean. Some assays are reporting lower values, especially for the green sample, which is all endogenous PTH value, the other two samples, the red and the blue values, are spiked with 124, which are closer to the reality or all method mean. So this highlights how it is challenging that the labs are not using the assays, which are very well standardized. So one hospital may be using one assay when the patient moves to the end of the lab, they will have to rerun that assay to get their data as a baseline before and after the surgery. So because they cannot use a different uh, uh, manufacturer's uh, PHT value to determine if the surgery is successful or not. Let's go back to the history of the parathyroid hormone. As you can see, this is a citation from 1973. There was a conference held at Mayo Clinic and I work at the Mayo Clinic and a lot of investigators got together and they discussed about how to develop a good assay for parathyroid hormone, what is its role. And then uh, these investigators have published uh, an article which highlighted the challenges of PTH testing and its complex role in the human physiology. The challenge in 1971 were that we did not have enough amount of PTH to inject into the animals to raise the antibodies. So that was one of the largest challenge. And those times it was difficult to synthesize PTH in the recombinant form for the PTH fragments as well. And the other challenge was there were no uh, technical uh, methodologies which allowed to look at all the various fragments uh, into the human serum or the plasma because the concentration of these PTH and PTH fragments are very low. This slide highlights the half-life of various PTH fragments, PTH 124, which is via intact and is active, its half-life is five minutes. PTH and terminal fragments also are bioactive. Their half-life is similar to five minutes, but PTH with terminal fragments don't have any bioactivity. And their half-life is much larger greater than 24 hours. And the C-terminal fragments, which lack the N-terminal fragments, they also have very long half-life, but their activity is controversial or is not well known. And as you can see here, that the C-terminal fragments build in patients with a chronic kidney disease and they can reach as high as 90, 90 to 95% of the total PTH um, mass in those patients. This just highlights we have tabulated what are the various possible PTH fragments reported in various papers. As you can see, PTH is a very active molecule and it gets metabolized into human circulation. And so uh, it is uh, uh, circulating in multiple fragments. And that is one of the challenges for various assays uh, that how many of these fragments get picked up in various assays and how many of these fragments are clinically relevant. And that is what we are learning as we uh, speak. The purpose of this slide is, as you can see, highlighted in green and red hair on my right hand side of the slide, that the levels of PTH are much, much lower than the levels of hemoglobin and albumin by few orders of magnitude. The lower the concentration of the PTH, the more challenging and difficult it is to perform that assay or build upon an assay. The lower the analytes, like other cytokines and interferons, will have a similar challenge to parathyroid hormone because you're trying to find a needle in the haystack 
which um, the current technologies are not there that we can pick them very specifically in very sensitive manner. The other challenge for the PTH testing is that the PTH hormone gets modified, and uh, this slide highlights that some of the methionines uh, can get oxidized, and that will change the activity of the PTH as well. And we would have to know uh, where is the PTH modification, uh, what kind of epitope that will respond to different antibodies, and if you're developing HDLC or mass spec tests, are you looking for unoxidized or oxidized form? The Nobel Prize for developing amino acids for various uh, proteins or peptides like PTH and insulin was given to Dr. Rose in yellow. And uh, she was successful in raising antibodies against insulin and developed a very good assay. And in those days, we had a competitive radio amino assay. And uh, Dr. Rose in yellow was awarded the Nobel Prize for that great contribution to our science in the lab medicine area. Because we have been thinking about PTH since 1970s, now we have three generations of the assays. We had the old competitive radio amino acids, then we replaced uh, the radioactivity with the chemiluminescence of fluorescence as a tag, and then we called them second generation assays. The other improvement we made was that we made those as a sandwich assays, which helped us in improving our sensitivity and specificity and the dynamic range of the assays. And now recently, some companies have tried to make an assay which is very specific to the first few amino acids of the end terminal, and they are categorized as third generation uh, PTH assays. This particular slide highlights the sequence of the PTH hormone. As you can see, one to seven amino acids are very essential for the PTH activity. And this helps in designing and understanding various assays. If somebody says C-terminal PTH assay, that means the antibody is more targeted to words on my right-hand side, which is the C-terminal of the PTH. And if somebody says intact assay, that means it is picking up as an intact or a whole molecule by having an antibody, one towards N-terminal, the other towards the C-terminal. And the third generation is still the same as the second generation, except their one antibody is more and more specific to the first few amino acids than a second generation assay, which may not be picking specifically the first three, four amino acids, but definitely it is towards the N-terminal region of the BTH. This slide highlights that uh, different manufacturers have targeted antibodies against different parts of the PTH. PTH has a three-dimensional structure, and various animals do respond to differently. And then you have to screen various antibodies uh, to get to that which antibody you would like to use for your assay. A little bit basic background here: How do the uh, the PTH assays work? As you can see here, this is a competitive amino acid. In competitive amino acids, you can use only one antibody. In the early 70s, we had only one antibodies. Even that was a blessing. You get one antibody out of those animals. So at that time, we were using PTH, and then we were using labeled PTH as a competition that labeled would be radioactive or chemiluminescence. But now we have moved to the sandwich assays where we can have one antibody against the N-terminal, second antibody against the C-terminal, and make a very good uh, sandwich. And this way, of the response is also linear compared to the incompatible assays where the response is inversely proportional to the signal. So there are many, many advantages of the sandwich assays and also using a signal which is either chemical in the sense of fluorescence compared to the radioactive signal. <clears throat> This slide shows that how the sandwich assay is performed and how the whole PTH assay is picked up as a intact molecule. And then all the fragments will not be picked up because the and both antibodies have to uh, bind to the PTH to get the signal. But if one antibody binds to N-terminal, the other will C-terminal, but that won't make a bridge and you will not see the signal. 
So this signal is only if the bridge is formed by using the intact BTH. In the beginning, the, the antibodies was raised and we also raised our own antibodies at Mayo Clinic. In the forms there, we injected one dose using the N-terminal peptide, the other dose with the C-terminal peptide, and then we purified the different clones of the antibodies and we mobilized one antibody, in this case a C1 to the bead, and then uh, the other antibody was labeled with the acridine and ester to get the signal. Once the assay is developed and validated, and so far we, in 1992, there was a lab developed assay by Mayo Clinic, and we were very fortunate that assay was able to separate patients from primary hyperparathyroidism for most of the patients with a secondary hyperthyroidism, even though there is a slightly overlap, but definitely it was able to separate patients who have the, uh, the hypercalcemia due to malignancy, as you can see on the x-axis in the blue brown color with the red dots there. And now um, there is a lot of effort trying to standardize. We have many, many manufacturers who make assays. They are trying to standardize uh, by using the common calibrator. The calibrator can be purchased from the WHO World Health Organization, and that helps in using um, the, the calibrator by different manufacturers, and hopefully we all will get the same results. And here is the highlight, the paper which was published in ClinCamp by Medicine 2018, and this is where they describe the differences in method A, B, C, and uh, two assays from the same manufacturers. But unfortunately, if you look at the data here, uh, whether you look at the zooming into zero to 100 picogram per ml or all the way to zero to 1,000, um, besides using the World Health Organization calibrator, there is no organization. Ideally, all of these lines should be on the top of each other, but uh, 1,000 is giving us different, different values. Um, when you spike WHO PTH standard in the human matrix and try to read into various assays, assays, so different colors are different manufacturers, A, B, C, D. The black manufacturer is closer um, to the accuracy versus other manufacturers are giving much higher values. So there are multiple papers showing up out there that how do we compare between different manufacturers, uh, even though there are differences in the slopes in the calibrators how about the correlation. And unfortunately, the correlation is also not very acceptable. These are the blend and mill part, which are highlighting uh, differences between Alexis and liaison. Ideally, all the dots should be closer to the line. You could have the constant bias, but at least you could predict that what kind of bias you will have one assay. But when you have bias spread out as, as it is, and it is very hard to predict what is the correlation between two different assays. And as you can see here, the slope of the assays between different ranges are different here. And this is uh, uh, very challenging and unfortunate that different manufacturers don't agree with each other. And all these manufacturers have shown that uh, uh, none of their assays have any interferences with the 7 to 84 PTH, but they haven't shown what is the interference between other PTH assets. So what's the difference between second and third generation PTH assays? As you can see here, there is an assay uh, called cyclic AMP, AMP activity PTH assay and intact PTH assay. And cyclic AMP is considered as a specific assay, which gives us lower values. And then the intact PTH assay gives us higher values. And then Nichols uh, Diagnostic also had the two assays, which were separating uh, 184 versus from the other fragments. But what you can see it here is that primary hyperparathyroidism and overlap the controls, the analytical uh, specificity may be better in 184 assays, but clinical performance of the two assays is not any different. Only the numbers are lower in 184 or the third generation assays compared to the second generation assays. Let's get back to one of the questions we asked in the beginning. We 
because of the challenges we have with the various PTHSs, are the PTHSs results even useful in patients with a chronic kidney disease? I don't think I will be able to provide that answer today. I will leave that answer to your own judgment. Uh, um, PTH uh, values do widen, like our reference range for PTH in CKD patients is very wide. For example, it can be two to nine times of the healthy population. And clinicians are not supposed to send these patients uh, for surgery as long as the value is between two and nine fold higher. As you can imagine, that is a very, very big range and it's not very helpful that because we may be missing some patients which we would have benefited uh, uh, from surgery and taking care of their secondary hypothyroidism. And SS do have different uh, prospecting with different factors as well. It has been proposed in the literature um, by different uh, experts in the field that maybe liquid thermography mass spectrometry method may be the candidate reference method and provide a guidance to harmonize and standardize various PTH assays. And we jumped on this wagon and in 19, uh, late, and then in 2010, we published to this paper, uh, one of all, my fellow Dr. Derek Moore worked on it and uh, we developed the LCMSMS method for 124 PTH. And similar method was also published by Mary Lopez's uh, group at that time. And her paper was also published in the same issue as you can see it here. So these were very good complementary papers and we had a great collaboration with the two groups. And so we hope that this did help uh, getting some clarity about problems with the various amino acids by publishing these two papers. I would like to you now you to walk through some of the data we collected during those times. Uh, when we published this paper, um, we were purifying PTH from the human serum by using one of the commercial antibodies, which helped us pulling PTH or PTH fragments. Remember, we were using only one antibody, which is on the C-terminal side, so it will pick up uh, 184 as well as C-terminal fragments. Then we digested uh, and ran on the triple mass spec, as you can see down here in the chromatography. We got multiple fragments of the multiple retention times here. We did try without uh, trips and digestions, but our sensitivity was not as low as we needed for the patient care. So we had to use trips and digestion, uh, not by choice, but that was our need to get good signal. Our workflow is highlighted in this slide here that we will incubate this bead, which can go into a 96 well plate and then add human serum, which is one ML, then we add labeled uh, N15 PTH as an internal standard. We incubate for four hours at room temperature, then we wash to get rid of all the interferences because the PTH should be bind to the beads and every other uh, non-PTH protein IGTs are be should be washed away. Then we digest the PTH and anything else bound to the antibodies and then we take those supernatant and inject into the mass spec. <laughs> this just highlights that uh, the molecular rate of the intact uh, PTH is 9,424.74 Dalton. It is the sequence of the PTH. And when you trypsinize, it does has a cleavage at uh, position number 13, and that was the fragment we were monitoring as a surrogate of 124, so 1 to 30 PTH was a surrogate for 124 PTH. And then the second fragment we added into our method, which starts with L and ended at K, which will be a surrogate for 7 to 84 PTH. And this thing says the same thing here in a linear PTH fashion manner, as you can see, we will be quantifying one to 13 of a mass spec acid because of the trips and digestion site that there. These are the mass spec transitions for the old analyte, 486.2 to 635.4, and for N15 would be 498.2 to 643, saying that 
we will have a number of uh, uh, amino acids which are labeled with new MT. As we were monitoring uh, multiple charge species here, and that's the reason our Q1 ion is 492, 413. Uh, it's, a, it's a two charge species. This uh, plot shows calibrating against the calculated, and we got a very good slope with the slope of 1.076, and uh, triple nine is a correlation. This slide shows those two peptides being separated from each other, 1 to 13, 7 to 13, and this is uh, what you get for a patient in the presence of the matrix. So this is the signal to noise. That will be the lowest, and we can see because seeing lower than will be within the noise. So this is one of the drawbacks to mass spec method is that it cannot see below 50 picogram per mile compared to the amino acids which can go down to 5 picogram per mile. When we compared our data from Roche PTH to mass spec PTH, we saw a reasonable acceptable correlation and uh, passing that block of the demon bit uh, for the comparison of the two. Although it looks acceptable in this figure, but if you look at the brand augment, then you start seeing the difference is much larger than acceptable clinically. Some patients will have as high as 40% values by one method and then lower by the other method. So we do have, and we still can't say which method is a gold standard because MASPEC still needs a lot of work. Um, this is just for the highlights here, that uh, this workflow is also laborious by the mass pack. So people have tried to replicate this work, and we are thinking that if the mass packs have gotten better in 2018, um, can we look for the intact proteins and peptides? Okay. So we need to still digest them. So this is the work uh, done by the CDC, Central Disease Control, under the leadership of Dr. Hubert Vesper. They just started this project and they're looking for intact uh, uh, proteins uh, and they're uh, very hopeful that they can see down to 10 or 15 picogram per mL. And this is various settings in the mass spec uh, looking for the intact 124 PTH. And this one is the mass spectrum for 124 in the presence of internal standard. Again, very good quality of the spectrum obtained by CDC. This is for the highlighting that you can really separate very easily and 15 labeled PTH from the unlabeled PTH because the molecule is large and all the amino acids are labeled. Then still the difference is going to be large between the two moieties. Previously, us. Uh, the looking for the intact PTH was attempted uh, by Moeri Lopez's group by using MALDI top approach. MALDI is not as sensitive as electrospray, uh, but they were able to see not only 124, but they were able to see many other fragments also in renal failure patients. And now the attempts are being made between Mayo and uh, CDC that can we look at the fragments which were observed by the MALDI, can we see the electrospray? This is very early work, preliminary work, where we are excited to see that some of these fragments are observed in patients with adrenal failure patients. One thing which uh, I would like to clarify in this field is uh, a lot of people talk about 784 parathyroid hormone existing in human circulation. This particular publication, which was led by Dr. Hoopnagel and looked at the data from Mayo, his own data, and the data from uh, Dr. Lopez's group that we have no indication that 784 exists in human circulation. So we need to start avoid using that the 784 is one of the PTH metabolites. But so far, we have not seen it. Uh, and now we are excited that because CDC and Mayo are working together to develop a mass spec assays to look for not only 124 PTH fragment, but we are going to look for many, many other fragments. And as you can see in the slide, the fragments which are highlighted as green were observed in Mayo's method. And then we're going to validate all these fragments in collaboration with CDC and see what are their relative concentrations in various patients. 
again, consider this as a preliminary work here on the slide here. Uh, there are various fragments which can separate patients with the chronic kidney disease from the controlled disease patients, and if this data is reproducible, then in addition to the 184, we can use other PTH fragments which will help us in improving the patient care for the chronic kidney disease. The PTHSs uh, do have a reputation that they don't compare very well each other, and this is a, again, I showed the data for 2018, but even 2003, um, some assays had a lower value, some assays had a higher value than all that they mean here. And not only that, having a consistent assay from a similar manufacturer was also a problem. And that was the reason, one of the reasons that Nickel Institute of Diagnostic had stopped making this assay and is not available in the market anymore. Is there an impact of having various assays uh, uh, in the market? The answer is yes. It can classify uh, different patients into different categories that patients, whether they need uh, some kind of drug treatment or the surgery. And if you notice here, by using Dickels Allegro Irma at one time, we had 13 patients in the PTH range up to 300, then we had 11 patients in the range of 300 to 599. But if I run the same group of patients by using the Nichols Advantage, then I would have uh, 17, 14, and 3, versus this antibodies assay will still give me 13. So antibody uh, intact assay is matching with the Nichols Allegro uh, in my assay, but it does not match with the ICMA assay. And the old diastole and intact assay only picked up three patients in this category. And the last assay had 18 versus 11 and 6 and 1. So different patients will get different treatments based on what assay is used, which is very, very concerning and not a good patient care uh, because we have differences in various. Uh, PTH uh, assays. So as you can see highlighted here in this slide here, we have different different uh, grouping based upon um, PTH values by different assays. What are the causes for different uh, values we get from different assays? The differences can be because every manufacturer is using different capture or label antibody. Every manufacturer is standardizing standardization against the different calibrators. And again, the matrix also is used differently to make the controls and calibrators. And each manufacturer has different um, information times that can also affect the quality of the assets. So in summary, the management of patients with a chronic kidney disease on uh, the mineral bone density is very complex and monitoring PTH value will remain part of the practice because today we don't have good imaging or good bone biopsies because they're very expensive and laborious. So patients and uh, the physicians will keep on ordering, but the value added to the patient care could be improved if we could harmonize various minerals PTHs between the manufacturers. And the request here is that the vendors should work with the CDC who is going to develop this uh, very poor post assay for not even the PTS fragments. And the goal is if we all work together, we will have a positive impact on the I would like to stop here and thanks for listening to me. I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is, why is it hard to standardize parathyroid hormone assays? Thanks, uh, Judy. It's a very good question. And I think in my 
second last slide, or yeah, I try to highlight here, and I think uh, this may explain some of the reasons, uh, but there could be more and more reasons. And uh, because of the competition we have among the manufacturers, among the commercial apps, everybody's using different recipes. And we don't have a consistent supply of the calibrator, consistent supply of the reagents. And all this is adding up to have a different recipes for different assays. And I think that could be uh, one of the major reasons for causing this uh, variability. And it will be hard to standardize assays until all the stakeholders sit down and meet and talk about it and uh, address this. Thank you. Next one is, what is the role of parathyroid hormone fragments? Again, um, million dollar question here. I think we are learning as we speak. Uh, the fragments have been known even though, but we don't know whether they are bioactive or not. So there are experiments being carried out. What are their uh, concentrations in patients with chronic kidney disease? Uh, we didn't, never had a good method to monitor those fragments. And now we will, for the first time in coming few years, we will have a method where we can look at the concentration of the fragments and then some physicians will have to do or some researchers will have to inject those fragments into animals or patients and determine whether they are bioactive or not. But either way, it will help the community that uh, we should. Thank you. Looks like we have time for one more question. Is a mass spec assay better than an immunoassay? Uh, yeah, again, uh, a, a tough one question, it depends whom do you ask. Uh, and uh, people think I will say mass spec is better than the amino assay. But um, I mean, if we were only looking for a patient population where the CKD uh, disease patient population was not in the patient care pool. So for primary hyperparathyroidism, I think amino acids are perfectly fine, even though they differ from each other, as long as the hospital uh, keeps on running the patient before and after the surgery or before or after the treatment. And physicians are aware of that. Uh, the mass pack assays are considered gold standard, but they come with a baggage. This is a very expensive, laborious technology. And implementing and replacing all the amino acids will not be a practicality. We just need to come up with a mechanism where Thank you. I'd like to once again thank Dr. Singh for his presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 15th, 2019. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye. All righty, perfect. You did a wonderful job. Very nicely done. Thank Perfect. you. Yeah, so what I will do at this point is I'm just going to put the final touches on the recording and get everything set to be broadcast over those live dates this week. And uh, just again, as a reminder, because we did pre-record everything, you will not have to be available over those live dates. If you are up for responding um, to any questions that are submitted, they would just get sent right to whatever email address you would like them to be sent to. And then at your leisure, you can respond to any questions via email. Okay. Perfect. And then the last kind of housekeeping question that I have on my end before we go today is, would you like to make your slides available for the audience to download in PDF format? Definitely not something that you have to do, but we do like to offer that if that's something you're interested in. Sure. Okay, perfect. I will make a note of that on this end. And did you have any final questions for me on your side before we go today? No, I'm good. Thanks for your time and uh, thanks, Judy. 
Wonderful. Thank you, well, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. I know you're very busy, so we do really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to do this. And if you do think of anything after we go here today, please don't hesitate to reach out. I will. Wonderful. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. You too, both. All righty. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.